My name is Vicki Goodman, and on behalf of the Friends of the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at UCLA, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Open Mind presentation. I'd like to begin by thanking our generous sponsors for this evening, evening's program, Belmont Village Senior Living in Westwood. Um, I especially would like to... Dogs always know things that are good, and Belmont Village is a great place, and their founder is here with us this evening, Patricia Will, came from Houston. At, stand up, Patricia, if you warm. So we are very excited and pleased to be screening the critically acclaimed documentary film, I'll Be Me which chronicles legendary country singer Glenn Campbell's struggle with Alzheimer's as he and the Campbell singers begin their goodbye tour of the US, Europe, and Australia. Um, if some of you missed the Grammys on Sunday night, um, I'm very excited to say that Glenn Campbell actually won a Grammy for the theme song from this movie, I'm Not Gonna Miss You. And the song is also nominated for an Academy Award, so um, we're very privileged to be able to see this film. And a huge thank you to the director, James Keach, for giving us this film. Mr. Keach, along with producing All Be Me, which is a real labor of love and really a wonderful film for, our, for the mental health community, for Alzheimer's families and their patients, uh, this has just done a great service, this film. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to see it. Um, Mr. Keach, along with producing this film, has also produced films like the Johnny Cash biopic, Walk the Line, which I, was a tremendous hit and so many people enjoyed and loved. And he's also the recipient of the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, which he received in 2010. And he also directed uh, both the TV series and the film, um, Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, which starred his wife, Jane Seymour. Um, I know that was a very popular show in our house with a young woman who became a doctor after watching that show. So thank you for all your accomplishments and for being here with us this evening and giving us this wonderful opportunity. Um, along with Mr. Keach, we have with us this evening Dr. David Rubin, who flew in from Washington, D.C. in time to be here for this evening's program, because I said, you have to be here, Dr. Rubin. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Rubin is the director of the multi-campus program in geriatric medicine and gerontology, and he's also the creator of the comprehensive Alzheimer's and dementia care program at UCLA, which he will be talking about after the film. We also have with us this evening Dr. Felipe Jane, who is an assistant professor of psychiatry at UCLA, and he is also the recipient of a Friends of Semmel Scholar Award, the 2013-2014 Scholar Award, which he's going to tell you a little bit about in just a moment. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers all of our presenters, Mr. Keach, for being here this evening. They will all be participating in a discussion after the film, and that discussion will be led by our faculty advisor, Dr. Andrew Luchter, who is a professor of psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences uh, at the David Geffen School of Medicine here at UCLA, and he is also the director of the Brain, Behavior, and Pharmacology Laboratory at the Semmel Institute. So it should be a wonderful discussion. Um, after the film, you will be handed out some index cards. If you would like to ask a question, 
at least write it down uh, and pass it to the aisle. Someone will be by to pick it up. We won't be taking questions from the floor. We'll be taking the questions from the cards. Um, tonight's program, just a little bit about the Friends of the Semble Institute for those of you who are here the first time. Uh, we are the support group for the world-renowned Semmel Institute, which is one of the leading centers for the study of the brain, behavior, and the mind. Um, it has a clinical and research staff of over 400 scientists who work together to um, find innovative treatments for illnesses of the mind and brain, and brain that affect one in four adults and one in five children in this country every year, just in this country alone. Um, we put on these open mind programs as a service to the community. They are free. Um, we bring together filmmakers like James Keach and scientists like David Rubin and Dr. Jane to present programs about mental health issues. Um, you can go to our website to find a calendar of our upcoming events. Our next event will be on Ma March 3rd on child and adolescent mood disorders. Uh, it will be led by Dr. Um, Miklowitz, David Miklowitz, who is the director of the Child and Adolescent um, Mood Disorders Program at the Semmel Institute. So I hope that I'll see some of you there. Um, and on April 19th, we are very excited. We will be having our Great Minds Gala. This is our fundraising event. All proceeds from this event go to benefit our Friends Scholar Program. Um, we give grants to brilliant young scientists like Dr. Jane, who you will hear from in just a moment. Uh, we will be honoring Chancellor Jean Block, the UCLA Chancellor, Homeland Producers Howard Gordon and Alex Ganza, and uh, former Congressman Patrick Kennedy. So you, if you go to our website, friendsofthesemmelinstitute.org, you can buy tickets there, you can find more information about the event. And I just want to say that none of these programs, the Open Mind, the Scholar Program, would be possible without the support of our members. So if you are not already a member of the Friends and a membership is $100 or anything that you would like to give, less, more, every gift counts. Um, if you are not already a member, I hope that you will pick up an envelope on your way out this evening or go to our website Again, friends of the Semmel Institute.org and support our work. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Felipe Jane. Thank you so much. Good evening. It's my honor and my privilege to address you tonight to tell you a little about the Friends Scholar Program and why I was chosen for an award. I became not only a clinician but also a researcher because I felt that research would be the best way to advance medicine and improve treatments for those who suffer. The plight of dementia patients and their family caregivers has touched me personally greatly because both my mother and my uncle uh, have become primary caregivers for members of our family who suffer from dementia. I came to psychiatry residency with a strong background in meditation. I learned from my parents, my father an East Indian who came to the US interpreting for a meditation guru, and my mother who spent much of her 20s as a renunciant in a meditation monastery, to the point that you might even say that I was a meditation baby. But perhaps paradoxically, growing up, I learned very little about psychology. Meditation and mindfulness, as I learned them, helped me to relax and to enter each moment with a little more kindness, a little more presence of mind than I otherwise would have had. But they did not provide me with a very complex or rich understanding of the kinds of problems that arise in intimate attachment relationships like my wife reminds me of more frequently than I'd like to admit. And also the kinds of difficulties that are exemplified by a family member who must care for a loved one with dementia. 
I therefore de designed a meditation program that would link some of the key psychological concepts surrounding helping to improve relationships with meditation and mindfulness techniques to help people relax. But it never would have been possible to do this and to begin to research it for dementia caregivers without the support of the Friends of the Semmel Institute. Very simply, the funding that the Friends Scholar Program has provided means the difference between the life of these ideas and their further pursuit and their just evaporating away. The Friends Scholar Program funds young investigators like myself to conduct some of the initial studies that help us to launch our careers. Very few funders of science are willing to go out on a limb for the kind of risky project that a new meditation intervention might represent, making this grant vital. Our preliminary results, after working with over 20 caregivers, have shown large effects on reducing levels of depression in caregivers, and this is a notoriously difficult problem to treat, and also that they've learned powerful tools to deal with some of the horrible stresses that they encounter on a daily basis while caring for their loved ones with dementia. One of our caregivers was even featured on Eyewitness News to talk about her improvement through the meditation study, how it made her able to treat herself more compassionately, but also to step into her mother's mind, into her mother's perspective who suffered from dementia, uh, and to gain greater insight. And this really helped her to reduce her stress and to bring more humor into the relationship. And the friend's investment has enabled others to see that these ideas are worthy of funding. We obtained additional funding to study how brain structure changes and brain circuitry changes as caregivers go through this program. The preliminary results have shown possible increases in gray matter volume. Normally, gray matter volume, that part of the brain that allows us to think, decreases with age. But over the four weeks of going through this program, the initial results show that there may be increases in gray matter volume throughout the prefrontal parts of the brain that are responsible for thinking, planning, empathy, compassion, those things that make us most human and most caring. We also saw that the cognitive control circuits that help us to intentionally use our mind to regulate our painful reactions and painful experiences were strengthened. But as a responsible scientist, I should say that these findings must be validated in larger samples. Uh, I should say we are still recruiting dementia caregivers, and if you know someone who is interested, you can please have them contact me. They might not be the only one to benefit from going through the program. You might too, if they change somehow. Self-interest, folks, come on. There are informational flyers on the back you can take on your way out. We're here tonight to enjoy a film about the final stage of life of a great American musician who tragically developed Alzheimer's dementia, but his story carries a lesson for all of us. The film has met with extraordinary reviews, and I'm so excited to hear its Grammy Award-winning song. Without further ado, Glenn Campbell, I'll Be Me. I noticed the dog didn't bark when you clapped for me. <laughs> I, feel, I feel cheated. Uh, let me just say that uh, this is the first time I've seen this film, and, and it's a wonderful film. It, it's a wonderful film. And thinking about this, you couldn't think of a better metaphor for Alzheimer's disease than a farewell tour, you know, it, it, that's what it is. It, it's a journey. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is a journey, and as you saw in this film, it's not only a journey of the patient, uh, because the patient's journeys are, are all pretty similar in a sense. They decline. These patients decline. They have various kinds of complications of their, of their illness, but they all, it's all down. It's a down disease. But it is a journey also of the family. And uh, here, uh, I think this is a remarkable family. 
uh, but it's only one of many, many, many remarkable families. And for each family of a person with Alzheimer's or other dementias, they all go through their, their personal journey. And, uh, and unfortunately, and we see this with Glenn Campbell, um, we see it with many, many people who were truly uh, the sequoias and the redwoods of whatever uh, discipline they were in, and this disorder just fells them like a tree. Uh, I have to tell a story, uh, not about Glenn Campbell, but about somebody who was as prominent in his own discipline, um, and it was a profession, he's a very well-known person, who uh, succumbed to this disease in his 60s and uh, went through a, a very stormy course, very stormy course, and, and just passed away uh, two nights ago. Uh, he was one of our, our, uh, my patients. And uh, his wife's story, his wife's story was very similar to Kim's. Uh, she, she had this amazing, amazing courage. And sometimes this disorder will bring out the courage that you never thought you had to face this journey. And I think with this family, uh, one of the great things about this film is there was a lot of humor in the film. There was a lot of humor in, in such a devastating uh, situation. And in fact, there are many ways we cope with, with illness like this. Um, but the, the overriding message is the courage, is the courage in going through this journey. About th uh, three years ago, a little more than, almost four years ago now, uh, I had a, a, one of my partner's patients, wife had Alzheimer's disease. And this man was quite wealthy and he'd given some money to the division. And he would periodically have problems with, with his wife. And it, the problems with his wife were that you know, the caregivers had a family emergency, had to leave, and, uh, and he'd be stuck on a Friday afternoon and wouldn't know what to, uh, to do about his wife's caregiving. So he would call me, like, like I, I could do something. And uh, generally, I, I kind of walked him through it, et cetera. And I realized that uh, if this person who was quite powerful, was quite affluent, had these problems, what about people who weren't as affluent, who weren't as resourceful, who didn't have those kind of resources? And so that began our journey uh, for the UCLA Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Program is to say that, in fact, this disease is not a treatable disease. We can give medications for it uh, that may help a little. They're not home run drugs. They're best base hit drugs. They're, they're not all that great. But if we can help people through this journey so that it's a journey of, uh, that is as less destructive as possible, this hurricane moves through, but sometimes you can, you can mitigate the damage of it. So we developed a program uh, that was actually based on a program in Indiana that was serving an indigent community, and here we've brought it pretty much mainstream, that, that basically the health system adopts the patient with dementia and their family members and says, we're going, we're gonna, we're gonna work with you till the end. We're gonna work with you till the end. And that is because we recognize that there is this integral unit of the patient and the family members. And it's not me as a physician, it's not UCLA as a health system who is the greatest asset to these patients. It is their family members. It is their family members. And what we try to do is to get these family members prepared, to educate them, to support them, to hold their hands, to walk them through so they can be like a Kim Campbell and, and help their, uh, their husband through. Uh, it's been a wonderful journey for us uh, there are many, uh, we, we now have over 1,100 patients in the program. Um, it, it's been a wonderful experience. And I think at this point, I'm just going to stop. And uh, there are many people who have much more interesting things to say than I do, and I'd love to answer questions as well. Thank you. I have um, a whole series of questions here, um, and several of them, James, really focus on uh, a, a 
actually one in particular question. When is the last time you saw Glenn, and, and how is he doing now, and how's the family doing? The last time I saw Glenn was about oh, two months ago. And, um, well, actually, I saw him on film a couple days ago. Because the, the, the kids and Kim always send me pictures of him and, and how he's doing. And he is in, uh, the way Kim puts it, in talk soup land, um, where he really isn't making a lot of sense uh, with, with his language. He's, he's in good physical health. Um, he, he loves to eat uh, dessert. Um, and um, he'll, he'll say things like, uh, thank you, Lord. Some things that really mean a lot, he recognizes Kim. He'll say he loves Kim, from, and he re recognizes her. Sometimes he thinks Ashley, his daughter, is Kim. And, um, but he's, and, he, and he's still happy. He's still got that sense of humor. He'll just start laughing. Nobody knows what he's laughing about, but he'll just laugh and laugh and laugh, and he'll get everybody else laughing. Um, so... I think he's doing pretty well. I also think he's also having some agitation problems too. I think he's 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 uh, he's having some of those issues too. So not everything is rosy, to to say the least. And uh, and and he's surrounded by people who come and see him all the time and play music for him. And he still really loves music. And um, I think the key for the Campbells has been the incredible support that they've had from. Um, the community of Nashville, his his family, his friends, and as you guys saw in in the the filming, one of the things that was so touching to me as a as a filmmaker was to watch the way the audience behaved, because the audience behaved like our society should behave. When Glenn was down and when he was his most most vulnerable, they lifted him up, they stood up for him when he made mistakes, they cheered him on. And uh, so there was no shame in his game anymore. And I think this is hopefully what we're going to do with the film is, is to create that, uh, that people who have Alzheimer's, whose families have Alzheimer's, uh, who are caregiving for people with Alzheimer's, that they are no longer feeling the shame and the stigma that goes with it, that this is, everybody's suffering from this. And, and hopefully that's what happened tonight, that there was a community feeling here and that everybody felt like, yeah, I've, I've been through this. I know this, and it's okay. One follow-up question um, about the family. Um, did the impetus for the film come from the family, and uh, do you feel that, th that they have any regrets about this, this project at this point? The impetus for the film did come from the family, and um, I was very reluctant to do it. As, as was, my, was my partner Trevor Albert, because um, I, I didn't know anything about Alzheimer's um, except it scared the heck out of me what I knew about it and everything I had seen, uh, certainly in the form of documentaries, um, was it was always at the end stages. It was always showed the the dark dark side of things. No humor at all, and. Um, uh, Julie and Raymond kept asking me to uh, get involved with it because I'd, I'd made Walk the Line because he kept thinking, you know, and I knew John Cash and the Cashes knew the Campbells and and so um, he finally said, would you would you meet Glenn? And Julian had been working with my son Johnny, who's who's here tonight, a young young musician, and and um, Glenn came over to the house and Johnny was walking across the living room with his guitar. And, uh, and he was with Kim, and uh, Glenn looks at Johnny and he goes, Hey, I play guitar. You want me to show you something? And he took the guitar from John and said, Yes, sir. And he took the guitar and he just shredded it. He just ripped on it. And then John went, Wow, and went to his bedroom like all teenagers do. And, um, <laughs> and, then, and then Glenn looks at Kim and he goes, uh, you know, when a man findeth a good woman, he findeth a good thing. I found me a good thing. That's my thing. And then Kim says, you know, we're here to talk to you about making a movie about Alzheimer's. And Glenn says, what's Alzheimer's? He says, you know, honey, it's about your memory. He says, I don't got Alzheimer's. I got part-timers. 
<laughs> so, and then Johnny came walking across the living room again with his guitar, and Glenn looks at him and goes, hey, I play guitar. You want me to show you how to play something? So we got to see the whole thing right there in a matter of minutes. This guy who loved his wife, who was not afraid to talk about what he had, who was a musical genius, who had an incredible sense of humor, and at that point, couldn't say no. Trevor couldn't say no. When we thought it was going to be five and a half weeks, they said, would you just film the tour part of it? Because we'd been out filming some other bands, so we had the camera equipment to do it. And it turned into not five and a half weeks, it turned into 151 shows and two and a half years of filming. So it's 1,300 hours of film. So I went from a, a guy who was a reluctant uh, uh, filmmaker to get involved to a man who's totally dedicated to changing, changing the course of this thing. And that's because Glenn wanted to do it. Glenn really wanted to do this. And so for me, I mean, you know, when he says, I, I ain't done yet, you know, most people are told that, I'm sure, you know, they go home, they hang it up. They say, you got Alzheimer's, and everybody, they, everybody goes, oh, no, that's it. My life's over. Our life's over. We can only expect the worst. Glenn went, no, I ain't done yet. You heard him say it. And I can just say that he sure as heck wasn't done yet. Like, like you all heard, he, 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 he just he won, our film won two Grammys the other night. And, uh, and he was nominated. Yeah. It's, and it's because of Glenn. It's because of Glenn saying, I ain't done yet. I want to share this story with everybody. He's nominated for an Academy Award. So, you know, what a legacy. I mean, what a legacy. And what a legacy for people who are suffering from this to know that somebody is, lead is leading the charge of continuing to live their life as fully, as 100% as they can, no matter what, Alzheimer's or not. You know, that's pretty cool. And do they have any regrets? The answer is no. In fact, Kim, every time she sees the film, she thanks me. She says, I feel close to him. I feel I have him back. And we have this experience that we shared together for these three or four years. And, and um, it, 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 it's, it's, it, it was a wonderful experience for all of us. It was, at times, really, really tough. But, but no regrets. No, not at all. Just a terrific story, terrific story. Um, you know, some of the questions have to do with what's preserved, and Dave, I wanted you to comment on this question in particular. Uh, one person from the audience writes, as a former musician and singer, I noticed that despite his problem of not remembering lyrics, he never forgot melodies, uh, no flats, no sharps, um, you know, is this common? What's, in terms of what's, what's preserved, what sorts of things are, are the last things to go, if, if they ever go? Well, uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly what's the last to go, but uh, you remember Dr. Peterson was showing the, uh, the uh, MRI and showing the hippocampus there. It turns out that the music center isn't so close to the hippocampus. I mean, it tends to be preserved far, uh, far later in the disease. And uh, as you saw that he, he barely could speak, he had a lot of aphasia, uh, particularly towards the end of the film. But he could still he could still sing and he could still play the play the music. Uh, interestingly enough, um, there's a, something called a Music Men's Mind program that uh, our program has, has some involvement with, and they uh, some of the patients in, who are in our program have formed a band. They they're, they're all uh, have Alzheimer's and, and and they're called the Fifth Dementia. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, they, they actually will be performing on, uh, on, uh, on Valentine's Day at the Bread, Brentwood Presbyterian Church, and they, they have lots of concerts. But uh, in fact, these were, were people who were musically inclined, and, and despite their cognition and, and memory loss, uh, they're still singing. That's awesome. That's like, that's fantastic. Did you come and put the name? No, no. I, <laughs> I, I love it. Yeah, it's a great one. Um, now, Felipe, you do um, a lot of work with families now in your caregiver uh, group. And there's one question uh, here about does the patient suffer or do they just accept this? And isn't it really the family that suffers? Um, you've been working with caregivers now in your support groups for a while. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? So I think that it's 
really a wonderful question. And it's a particularly great question because oftentimes I think we as family members suffer even more than the patient with with dementia actually suffers. And that's some of the things, that's, that's one of the major insights that some of our caregivers have as they're going through the meditation process. It turns out that depressed caregivers often see even more pain uh, in their loved one and report more pain uh, than the dementia patient themselves actually report. Whereas the caregivers who are not depressed uh, don't report that uh, elevated amount of pain that is a mismatch with uh, what the patient themselves uh, reports. So there's a way in which sometimes we get wrapped up in what they're going through and how bad the suffering must be that can sometimes be a projection of, of what it is that we're experiencing inside of how the disease makes us feel. And I think that ties into uh, what James was saying about the shame that goes along with, uh, with dementia and the shame that caregivers have about their family members who have dementia and the illness, especially as they're going to gatherings, group gatherings, what's uh, mom going to do, what's dad going to do, what's my husband going to say. Uh, but the, the, the beautiful thing is that when a caregiver can emerge from that tunnel vision about what's going wrong and really step back and reconnect with, uh, with themselves, with the good things that remain in their loved one and the people around them, they find a whole lot more support. Thank you. Um, some of the questions have to do with issues of diagnosis, uh, characterization of the illness. Um, one question here, and something that I think might t help us, if we could take a step back, Dave, for a second, you could help us address this, and that is, can you clarify the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? That's probably one of the most common questions I'm asked. And the way to think about this is the umbrella term, the headline is dementia, and Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. There are others. Uh, there's dementia associated with Parkinson's disease. There's something called Lewy body dementia. There's frontal temporal dementia. There's vascular dementia. But uh, at least 60 to 80 percent is Alzheimer's disease. But the big umbrella term is dementia. Right. Thank you. Uh, James, some of the questions have to do with, um, I think, some of the, the hardships of filming the story. Um, one question is, I think, and it, this resonated with me, particularly watching the final scenes of the movie, um, when he's clearly struggling on stage, did it ever get just too painful? Did it sometimes get to the point where you, you wanted to turn away or turn off the camera uh, because it was too difficult to take? Well, as a filmmaker, you never want to turn off the camera when it gets... <laughs> When it gets difficult, that's, that's when the drama is really happening. And that's when the truth is really coming out. What is important is, 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 uh, is when you're editing it, is to, at least in this case, is to always keep this man's dignity. And to always imagine if this was my dad, if this was my, you know, my best friend, which he became, you know, what would I want to show? But what would he want me to show? And he wanted this to be seen. So it was a careful dance. And, and at times, there was, there was moments in this film that when we were filming that it got really, really rough. But you know, um, when we made Walk the Line, for example, Johnny Cash, uh, I don't know if you saw the film or not, but Johnny Cash had a small problem with drugs. And, um, and, and, and so. I saw the film, I don't recall the small part of the problem. <laughs> Well, they were little pills. Oh. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, and we would have research screenings, which we did a lot of screenings of this film, by the way, because this this was a dance. One of the things that we really wanted to do, Trevor and I were really concerned, and and, and one of the editors, Zemo, is here tonight, who also helped a lot, and yeah, and. Uh, 
and, and you're getting some uh, some barf, Simo. Um, and 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 Elise, we were we were all always very conscious of taking the audience too low and bouncing them back up because and that's was that's also Glenn's personality. Glenn says I've laughed and I've cried. It's a hell of a lot better to laugh. And and uh, so when we, there was a lot of instances in Walk the Line, we had three or four scenes. We do research screenings and the audience we would do cards like you guys are doing tonight and. They'd, we'd ask for criticism. Which scenes did you like most? Which scenes did you like least? And they always came back with, they, li they liked the drug scenes the least. They said, we saw one that was plenty. So I guess in your choice lies your talent. So we, we didn't want to shy away from the truth, but we also didn't want to beat everybody over the head with, you know, we know what he's going through. We know he's going to get angry. We don't need to have five anger scenes. One great one says it all. You know, you know, so that's it. But I can also tell you that being witness to a lot of it personally um, was tough. It was tough. It was tough, especially for the family. You know, Glenn would would go there and, and, and but when he became conscious of what he'd he had done, which he did. You saw him. He, he he knew what happened a couple of times. It was so poignant to see this man. He loves his family so much to to realize that he'd gone down this rabbit hole and he didn't he didn't. But everybody kept saying to him, "Honey, it's okay. You you you're sick. You've got an illness." And everybody had to remember that. But a lot of people, the caregivers, you know, um, we've been talking about starting a a, a program to help restore the spirit of the caregiver. There's a, uh, like in post-traumatic stress syndrome, you know, there's a moral injury that happens. And I think there's a moral injury that happens to caregivers with Alzheimer's patients too. And that's what you were talking about. I think it's really important for those folks to, to have some restorative uh, programs to, to help them come out of this. Because it's, it's very traumatic, very traumatic for people who go through this, you know. Definitely. Um, you know, we're, the hour is getting a little late here. We have more questions, but I know that uh, uh, some of you do need to be getting home. Um, I want to, first of all, start by thanking James once again for sharing this magnificent film with us. I want to thank the sound effects manager here. Um, I, I, I want to thank our, our uh, discussant, Dr. Rubin, our other discussant, Dr. Jane. I, I want to thank the friends, <clears throat> excuse me, the friends for putting on this wonderful event this evening. Obviously, uh, by the, the full house we have here, clearly an important topic and one of a lot of interest. There are a lot of topics like this, and we couldn't be addressing these putting on these films, lectures, and addressing these crucial issues without your help and support. So please, if you haven't joined the Friends, please do so now. And if you have, please give generously so we can continue to put on these wonderful programs. And we hope to see you at our next event on March 3rd. So thank you once again for coming out tonight. <laughs>